Hello and welcome back to Unheard. The president of Iran is dead. As usual, when a big event like this happens, there's a lot of fumbling around in the media for things to say about that country, which is so much at odds with Western powers. But is there another story to be told about Iran? Very few living people have been British ambassador to Iran. Apart from anything else, there have been long periods where we didn't have any diplomatic relations, so there was no ambassador. But Sir Richard Dalton is one of them, having been ambassador there in the 2000s after a posting to Jerusalem as Consul General. In one sense, Sir Richard is the ultimate establishment voice, a knight of the realm, old-school diplomat. He talks in the cut-glass accent of a John le Carré novel. But in our conversation, which covered the reality of politics in Iran, Western attitudes to Israel as well as Saudi, he puts forward some quite radical and anti-establishment views. Hello, Sir Richard. Hello. So first of all, Ibrahim Raisi, the now deceased president, he was known as the Butcher of Tehran for his involvement in various commissions there. What what should we think about him? Uh, He's a controversial figure. Uh, You allude to his role in the 1980s in a committee that was reviewing the records and the reasons for imprisonment of a large number of political prisoners in the early years of the revolution after 1979. What to do with these people was the problem which the system under its then leader, the founder of the Islamic uh, Republic, Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, and he he said, you know, sort this problem out. And there was a committee of four people. The youngest member was Raisi, age 28. And the committee reviewed these cases in a summarily manner and sent many thousands off to execution. And that's where his title that you refer to, the Butcher of Tehran, came from. It's something which the opposition in Iran uh, attaches to him, of course, uh, not the not the system. The system sees him as an exemplary servant of the Islamic Republic. Does the death of the president make a moment of instability for a country like Iran? Or actually, is it all the supreme leader anyway, so they'll just replace him and it's less of a big deal? The betting is on stability in the internal system. But when you've got factions within the conservative group that supports the Islamic Republic, supports the supreme leader, those factions will be jockeying now to try and choose a candidate that represents their point of view and would advance their people if arrived in power. That jockeying is largely opaque. It's very similar to the jockeying for power that takes place, say, in uh, the Conservative Party of Britain. You get groups who, I mean, I remember a Labour Party uh, political advisor telling me decades ago that uh, the divisions between Labour and the Conservative were as nothing to the divisions between different parts of the Labour Party. And Iran is exactly the same. So how that will play out is unknowable. So in other words, we're gonna, there's going to be an internal competition between different factions of essentially the conservative wing of Iranian politics. But foreign policy wise, you don't think this is going to be a big moment for change or indeed an opportunity for Western powers to affect any kind of shift? Western powers have made themselves an enemy of Iran uh, because they regard Iran as hostile. And Western powers have no influence whatsoever in Iran. The facts of hard power can influence Iran, but the various dialogues that began in the late 90s and flourished for a short while during my tenure between 2002 to 2006 came to an end pretty well in in 2005 with the election of President Ahmadinejad. Uh, Since then, diplomatic contacts have been maintained, and in specific contexts, diplomacy has been absolutely vital, notably in the limitation and monitoring of Iran's civil nuclear program, Uh, which led to the famous JCPOA, Joint Programme of Action, to limit Iran's nuclear activities, which was then ditched unilaterally by the Americans. So diplomacy is important. There's influence there on specific subjects. But how Iran runs its internal affairs 
is for the Iranian people themselves, uh, there's no uh, way in which the outside world can significantly influence the pace, direction, or end product of change inside Iran. I notice you said Western powers regard Iran as hostile. Does that mean that they're wrong to do that? Do you do you lay some of the blame at the feet of Western leaders for the, the current standoff? Uh, well, I do, because I believe that the Western eruption into the region after 1945 has had significantly negative consequences, uh, despite our idealism, whether in establishing the state of Israel or in trying to change the government of Afghanistan and then change the government of Iraq or change the government in Yemen, uh, leaving Israel on one side, uh, our efforts have been pretty disastrous. Uh, huge suffering, and Iran has been on the side of those who say that the invasion of Iraq should never have happened. The invasion of Afghanistan led to disaster. Iran is hostile to a, a lot of Western policy. We could debate case by case who has the better arguments. And what I believe is that we do need to have that debate rather than adopt the intellectually lazy and politically damaging view which you hear all too often, which is Middle East was perfectly stable until Iran came along. Everything that's happening, Syria, Yemen, Hamas, it's all Iran's fault. And we just need to be more resolute in confronting Iran and everything will be fine. That's, a, that's caricature, but it's, it's what you hear that Iran is a destabilizing force, as though somehow the Western invasions in the 21st century and our support for the cruel Saudi and UAE invasion of Yemen was somehow stabilizing rather than actually destabilizing and leading to immense suffering. But, I mean, Sir Richard, we, we had a moment under Barack Obama where we tried to pull Iran in from the cold or reboot that relationship, whatever phrase he used. And it's quite widely considered a bit of a disaster, the, the deal that he presided over, where plane loads of cash were being sent to Iran. It didn't result in their nuclear program becoming safer. It hasn't resulted in better relations. It's just resulted in giving them some extra money. That's the reputation of that deal. Is, is that wrong? Totally. Uh, the JCPOA worked. It was the most intrusive and successful nuclear program limitation and monitoring program ever negotiated. It was in the interests of Israel, the United States, European Union, the region of, of Iran. And it was unilaterally skewered by the United States at the behest of Israel in a way that was highly damaging. Now, if you want something out of a country, you've got to give them something. So the, the idea that allowing Iran access to its own money was somehow a gratuitous gift which should not have been undertaken is simply false. If you want intrusive monitoring, if you want derogations from Iran's clear rights under the International Atomic Energy Agency's procedures and under the Non-Proliferation Treaty, if you want Iran not to do things which they are entitled to do in international law, then you've got to provide something for them. And President Obama's team, supported by the Europeans and the Russians and the Chinese, the Russian and Chinese roles were highly constructive. Those teams produced something really worthwhile. After Trump's unilateral American withdrawal from this highly beneficial agreement, Iran stayed in compliance for a full year. The other thing to bear in mind, too, is that as a result of the United States not fulfilling its obligations to facilitate normal financial transactions, uh, Britain and European powers were unable to do for Iran under the deal what they were committed to do. We were in breach 
of the JCPOA from right from the start. We were told by Foreign Office officials in 2016, when it came into force, that the key to preservation of this highly advantageous limitation and monitoring of the Iranian civil nuclear program was that the West delivered on its economic undertakings. That was British policy. But we were defeated by the Americans. Because they literally blocked payments. They refused to allow the dollar's use for transactions involving Iran. And they were slow and hesitant in lifting the restrictions in the bilateral sanctions regime that Iran suffered under by the United States so that companies thinking, well, should we trade with Iran or are we going to get ourselves in such trouble that we start losing our business with the United States? Company boards took the responsible decision, which was to say, well, yeah, it'd be nice to do business with Iran, but business in the United States is much more important. So Iran was cheated after 2016 of what it had every right to expect, namely normalization of trade and finance. So I suspect, we, I think we should talk about Israel before we run out of time, Sir Richard, because this looms over this conversation. And I suspect if you're Israeli and watching this, or if you're an American who feels strongly that Israel needs full support, you will say, well, here's a, a British diplomat who's gone loco. He's being too soft on Iran. He's not mentioning the fact that they are deliberately supporting uh, terrorist groups. They have widespread operations and that they are committed to the destruction of the state of Israel. What would you say to them? I would say that Israel needs support in confronting the Iranian policy of seeking an end of the state of Israel. Uh, and I would say also uh, that where uh, there's any unprovoked attack on Israel by Iran, then we are right to support Israel. Uh, we are also right to deplore and decry and impose sanctions on those who use terrorist methods against Israel. So I deplore Iranian support for Hamas. I also deplore which is real, just Israeli to, just support to, just to for Hamas. Clarify, you, but do you do believe Hamas is supported by Iran and the and the attacks on Israel? would have been known and condoned by Iran. If you're referring to October 7th, 2023, not known in advance by Iran, but condoned and supported by Iran once undertaken. But there are, there are many complexities to why Hamas is where it is. And one of the reasons is that after they won the Palestinian elections, we boycotted them. I was one of the last... British diplomats ever to talk to Hamas political representatives, which I did in 1993. This is while you were consul general in Jerusalem. After the Hamas uh, victory in the Palestinian elections, uh, the West decided to boycott Hamas. And the British Prime Minister at the time, Tony Blair, is on record as saying that he regrets that. And he's right. There are many ways in which policy of simply refusing to talk to Hamas has not been in anyone's interest. Uh, and uh, I'd also, on the subject of who has helped maintain Hamas in power, refer to the fact that it's a well-known policy of the Prime Minister of Israel, Mr. Netanyahu, that if you support Hamas, uh, for example, by allowing funding through to them, from foreign sources, which, which is what Mr. Netanyahu's government did, uh, you will maintain the split in Palestinian political life between Fatah and Hamas, and thus make it less likely that Israel would ever have to confront the need to establish a Palestinian state. So you're actually contending that Prime Minister Netanyahu wants Hamas in power in Gaza because it divides the Palestinians? No, I don't think he does. No, he wants to destroy Hamas utterly. Uh, but there was a period 
when their policy was to, quote, mow the lawn, namely if Hamas started attacking outside Gaza, uh, then you move in and you have a short, sharp war. Uh, that was policy under Netanyahu and under uh, different Israeli uh, leaderships. Uh, that, of course, changed because of the appalling ferocity and obscenity of the October 7, 2023 attacks. And Netanyahu's policy now is not to manage the Gaza problem. Uh, it's to destroy Gaza uh, and to eliminate Hamas as an active force. And to be clear, you think that the West is condoning that or allowing it to happen? Uh, what should Western policy be in response to that? Western policy now, as it should have been for some months, is to say enough is enough, that war crimes are probably being committed. Uh, we now know from the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court that that view is correct. Uh, we also know from the debates inside Israel that many people, including former prime ministers of Israel, believe that the aim of destroying Hamas militarily is unachievable. Uh, and people like me have been saying that for months. And we predicted that Israeli cruelty, the desire for revenge, would have the kind of effects which it has had, not just in suffering of civilians and the risk to the international legal regimes around conflict, uh, but also persuading more and more Palestinians that military resistance is the only way forward. After all, if you look at the history of the moves forward towards self-determination, which is British policy on the Palestinian people, when there have been moves forward, tragically, it has been the result of significant violence. And the Palestinians see that. And they are not going to somehow magically be beaten into submission and to abandon their desire for their political rights just because of the appalling horror of Gaza. This was predictable. It was predicted and more and more people in Israel see that Netanyahu hasn't got a policy that will lead to a better situation for the security of Israel long term. Uh, and those rifts are, of course, appearing in the Israeli war cabinet at this very time. Final question on this, because it's not, it's not where our conversation started, but I feel I have to ask, what should Israel have done then? You refer to Israeli cruelty, which is quite a, a strong term in response to the obscenity, as you called it, of October 7th. What would you have had them do? Just nothing? Or what, what, what would the plan have been? I think punishment of the kind that they have exacted on Gaza and the rulers of Gaza after previous attacks on Israel was necessary, but thereafter, the policy of destruction of all facets of life, economic, civil, religious, cultural, educational, and medical, that deliberate policy was utterly wrong. And there's no doubt that Britain, several countries in the European Union, the United States, have connived at that, and I will always maintain that that is morally wrong, it's legally wrong, and it's politically counterproductive. Let me ask a final question, which is on a little bit of a different topic, but it feels so relevant to this conversation. Uh, in the past week, an article was published in the Atlantic magazine detailing a, an ongoing legal case in the U.S., about Saudi involvement in the 9-11 atrocities. And there are claimants who have a whole reams of new evidence that suggests that 
officials and people closely connected to the Saudi regime at the time were actually facilitating the 9-11 plotters to a much higher degree than was previously known, and that if any nation state should be associated with that, it was Saudi, not Iraq, who of course was ultimately invaded. What's your response to that? Do you think that's true? I don't believe personally, but this is a matter of gut instinct rather than anything else, that the Saudi government would knowingly have aided and abetted an attack likely to lead to mass casualties on their principal security guarantor. Uh, Individuals within the the Saudi system might have gone too far, uh, but actually untangling that is, is, is something which can only be done in the United States. So you're not someone who thinks that the US is too friendly with the Saudi government compared to other governments in the region? I do think that the United States makes mistake after mistake in its policy towards the Middle East. Uh, And one is over-reliance on Israel and Saudi Arabia uh, rather than working towards, in the medium and long term, cooperative security arrangements. You only got stability in Europe by negotiating across lines of enmity from the original Helsinki conference onwards. When you look at the overall situation then, where we are now, do you think there is a peaceful path out of here? Or if you're making a prediction, do you think we're headed for only more conflict? I see no peaceful path at present because there is no dominant power able to keep people in order. Uh, There's an expansionist power in Israel that wants to create total control in perpetuity across all the land between the Jordan River uh, and the sea and relegate the Palestinian people to a subordinate status, rather like the Bantustans in South Africa. Uh, I see uh, disorder fermented by outside powers, a whole range of them in several countries, whether it's Yemen uh, or Syria. Iran is one of those countries. Uh, Turkey, United States, Israel uh, are among among the others being involved. Uh, I also deplore the kind of action which the UAE is taking in supporting one side in the South the uh, Sudanese civil war. So you're absolutely right that old habits of power politics uh, are alive and well and producing the disorder and instability which they have always produced in the Middle East. There's high levels of emotion, there's high levels of ideology, there's over-reliance on military force as a solution despite the record of military force, whether in Afghanistan, Iraq, or Yemen, or Syria, in not yielding durable, stable, and humane results. So all the ingredients are there for continued tension and intermittent quarreling leading to loss of civilian life. So yes, I am pessimistic. I hope that under a new Iranian leadership after the death of Ayatollah Khamenei, it will be possible to renew the diplomatic drive to engage Iran and to recognize its legitimate interests in the security of the the region. I'm hoping that the West will moderate its all-out support for Israel and do something serious to assist the development of a two-state solution, and so on. One can see routes through to a better Middle East, but the political will to get there is lacking. Sir Richard Dalton, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thanks to Sir Richard. Thanks to you for tuning in. This was Unheard.